Hi, um, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and particularly to be discussing... Can you speak up a bit? Oh yeah, okay, maybe yeah. I'll... Can I stand up? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, well, just to say uh, who I am, in so far as it's relevant to the discussion, I'm co-editor of Red Pepper magazine, and there are copies there just to take a sample of, and I really urge you to subscribe, because it's... I hope Dave agrees. It's a place where, you know, there can be real debate um, that's kind of thinking aloud. So, um, uh, you know, ideas that are in the making. I mean, I think the word emerging is in one of your workshops. So we're not a sort of didactic line magazine. We're a magazine that's committed to socialism, but recognising that socialism has to be remade. And that remaking has got to be a a thoughtful process, but thought related to action. So Red Pepper is an attempt at that kind of active, <coughs> engaged thought. So I urge you to be involved. Um, so now, just to, to contribute. Um, so firstly, it's really um, exciting to be part of a discussion where socialism can be put in the framework of a discussion about technology. Because for me, uh, socialism is, is about an entirely different system of production, system of relationships of production, and therefore relationships of technology. So I'm not going to be talking about the state and state socialism. I'm going to be making a critique of what has been understood as socialism, state socialism. But I'm going to focus on production, and particularly on the producers, but also their relationship to the users. Because what I think is crucial in, in terms of thinking, in the end, I want to be talking about agency, or I want you to be talking about agency, because I won't have enough time. Um, but um, I think, therefore, one wants, we want to start with the tensions. At an early workshop, Jane um, over there, my friend Jane Chalice, talked about contradictions and this really excellent book, which um, you must get hold of by David Harvey, called The 17 Contradictions of Capitalism. Or 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. The End of Capitalism. And so what I, want, I want to talk about one really central contradiction, which, which is also very... Um, central to how we uh, develop a sense of agency about uh, the technology that we face, the technology that's kind of imprisoning us and destroying the planet. Um, and that is really the contradiction between use value, the production of use value, the production of things that are useful or <coughs> services that are useful, um, and the production of exchange value, i.e. the production uh, of commodities that, that make profit. And that within every um, labour process under capitalism, you know, th there's a tension because both are, are involved. Um, you know, workers are both producing something useful. They are kind of often very conscious of their skills and the uses to which what they're producing of, is being put. And that's often their first loyalty. Um, and on the other hand, the production of exchange value, i.e. production for profit, the fact that the the way in which their companies own the whole kind of structure of the market and the economy means that actually, in the end, their labour will be the basis of profit. I mean, it'll be, it'll be paid a wage and, and the surplus will be extracted for profit. And that tension is kind of apparent in all kinds of struggles. I mean, there's one I want to focus on, but just to illustrate it with a more everyday one that maybe people here are facing, which is around privatisation. You know, workers are resisting privatisation, and in doing so, they're, they're stressing the, the use value, the usefulness of what they're doing as teachers, as, as doctors or, or local government workers. And they're saying, we're defending the use value. We don't, want to, we don't want to be part of, we don't see water or health or education as a commodity. We don't want to see it being the basis of making a profit. So we don't want it to be turned into an exchange value. So their resistance is based on this, this commitment to the use value of what they're doing. And the example that I want to draw um, or stimulate a discussion about socialism uh, comes from exactly such a campaign about technology and the purposes of production and the, the nature of technology. So what I want to talk about is the Lucas Aerospace um, Shop Stewards Alternative Plan for Socially Useful Production. So maybe just, has anybody heard of that? Who's heard of that? Okay. And, and do, do people want to know the details? I mean, who hasn't heard of it or who doesn't know the details? Okay, well, I'll go into, um, you know, at least the basic outline of it. I mean, basically, in the mid-70s, when, when uh, workers at the point of production were pretty well organised, and in Lucas Aerospace, 
there was a particularly well organized what was called a combine committee and it was a combine committee in two respects firstly it combined brought together the workers from every part of the production process the, the most skilled designers in the country um, highly skilled uh, crafts people engineers and and then uh, general laborers and in a sense this gave them a huge confidence they they would talk about management as being like a habit um, sort of learned in public school. You know, it wasn't, to them, it wasn't integral to the process because they, they had the knowledge and the, the craft skill and they knew management completely depended on them. So they had this, as a, as a collective, as a combine committee, they had a, an incredible sort of confidence in their own skills and capacities for use, for, for, for useful production. Um, though, you know, they, ha they were at that point making missiles. Um, and then they were a combine committee in the sense of uh, bringing together workers from all the different com plants, different factories across <laughs> the UK, from Willesden in the south to Burnley in the north. And they, like many other um, groups of workers, were being faced with un unemployment. Um, on the one hand, uh, their company was subject to all the sort of pressures of international competition and the management, the first thing they looked at was cutting labour, cutting the costs of labour. On the other hand, um, the, the, it was a whole form of production that was very, um, very subject to automation, to computer-aided um, design, computer-aided manufacture. So they were going to be threatened uh, by, by um, unemployment as a result of automation. But they, they had this sense of, well, no, our, our <coughs> skills, our capacities are not useless, they're not redundant. We could be making all kinds of useful products, medical equipment, energy conservation equipment, transport equipment. So they first wrote to a whole lot of academics to say, look, we've got these skills, we've got this, this machinery, what do you think we should do? And, there, and about two people, from, mainly from the British um, Society for Responsibility in Science, wrote back saying, you know, we can help, you know, we'd like to help. But generally the response wasn't adequate. So they said, well, let's go to, let's look to ourselves. So they wrote and discussed to all their different um, shop stewards committees, the different trade union members in their factories. And over a period of about three months, you know, having asked people, what, what should we be doing? What could we be designing um, as an alternative to the dole? And, you know, as an alternative to missiles. I mean, uh, some of the leading people in the combine committee were part of CND, you know, and actually would prefer not to be. Um, you know, b creating really vicious kind of missiles. So, three minutes. three minutes. Okay. So anyway, very quickly, as a response, they got um, about twelve, no, no, twenty-one. Sorry, different products, which I won't go into details, but different socially useful <coughs> products. The the initiative was called the Shop Stewards Lucas Aerospace Shop Stewards um, Combine Committee's Al uh, Alternative Corporate Plan for Socially Useful Production. They. They fought for it, they tried to negotiate for it, but management saw them as a real threat to, to a manager, their managerial prerogative. I mean, some of the products have now been developed in other companies, but, but they were challenging management power and control over production, over the decisions about investment. Uh, and, and so they, they um, failed on that front. And politically, it's a long story, but we can go into it later, that or how Tony Benn had stimulated it when he was Minister for, for Industry. But he'd been basically sacked from that job precisely because he was working with the, the workers <laughs> and not just doing deals with trade union officials. The trade union leadership, the key ones, didn't support it because, again, this combine committee was a threat to their power. Uh, and the successor to Tony Benn, Gerald Kaufman, uh, in the end just refused to support it. So now it's, it's, it's really become... Um, a, a, a kind of vivid and practical in the sense that it was based on very practical ideas. Um, demonstration that an alternative is possible, that you know, one doesn't have to accept technology as it's you know, being introduced by corporations and, and backed by the government. There is an alternative. And it's also, just to draw out the key conclusions, the key thing for me is that it demonstrates that, 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 that those on whom capital depends, in this case skilled and workers and designers, have got the power to not just refuse, but to actually demonstrate that and show that there is an alternative, that transformation is possible, and to do so in a, through the, their social capacity. So this is where socialism is, for me, not about the state, but about the social. 
that will involve state support where possible, but it involves also forms of social organisation that basically socialise the knowledge and the power that workers have. And knowledge is the other key aspect of this. These workers had a very clear sense that they had a knowledge which people call tacit knowledge, the knowledge of things that, that you, the kind of know-how, things you know but cannot tell, things you know but you cannot necessarily codify, but through collaboration, through practical discussion, through design, through actually showing, I mean, they designed and built many of these products and took them around as part of the, the, the campaign. So it was a sort of campaign by example, campaign, a sort of agitprop of example, but based on this value of the, of the practical knowledge uh, of, of the worker. So it was kind of unpacking technology and saying, look, technology depends on, on, on practical knowledge, it depends on social relationships. And we, through the Combine Committee, can actually show uh, an alternative um, direction for technology. So it's a kind of sense that technology isn't neutral, it, it's imbued with values and with politics. Um, and that we need an alternative politics, but we need alliances. I mean, that's what, talking in the earlier workshop, listening to, I think it's Carl, yeah, pro, who's a... Pro, um, of an engineer, a control systems engineer. Yeah, yeah, now he's like a sort of Mike Cooley of the future. And there are many people like Carl, and sort of the left isn't valuing that kind mm -hmm. of skill and capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need alliances that, that bring together people like Carl with scientists, with communities, I mean, this was the kind of thing that happened with Lucas Aerospace. Um, since I've probably got to stop, I'll just end with a quote from Mike Cooley, because he, he's a very, you must buy this book too, Mike Cooley, Architect or Bee. You know, you remember Marx's distinction between the architect and the bee, that a bee, a, you know, produces an amazing, you know, result. You know, what, I've never actually seen a beehive, but I've seen bee comb, what they call honeycombs. And, you know, you just think of the sort of intricacy of that. Um, but an architect who also, they can produce monstrosities, but also they can produce very beautiful and useful things. And the difference is that while the, the bee is, is responding to circumstances, is, is kind of doing things automatically. I don't want to denigrate bees, but um, the, the architect, um, the architect yeah. is imagining, you know, it's got a kind of conception an imagination of what the the, uh, the end product of their work is going to be. <coughs> and so he talks, he ends up by saying, um, the alternatives are stark, and that's very much true now. Either we have a future in which human beings are reduced to a sort of bee-like behavior, reacting to the systems and equipment specified for them, or we will have a future in which masses of people, conscious of their skills and abilities in both the political and a technical sense, decide that they are going to be the architects of a new form of technological development which will enhance human creativity and mean more freedom of choice and expression rather than less. So I suppose I'm talking about a kind of socialism on wh in which we have a, a system, if you like, and a set of relations in which that creativity is realised uh, and in which people can not only express themselves but actually collaborate and produce together in a way that is a benefit to all. Thanks. Thank you.